Hello and welcome to this portion of Love and Respect. This is part of the uh, Portion Ministries, Authentic Word, but then there's Love and Respect, and that's dealing with relationships, predominantly marital and engaged relationships, but definitely relationships, whether it's, it's submitted unto leadership, at church, at work. And so we're going to just delve into something that the Spirit of the Lord led me to on this weekend, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 8 verses 1 through 3 and 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verses 1 through 3 but we're going to just kind of peruse over the text and so let's just start with the word prayer God we come giving you glory we thank you for yet another day to be alive in the land of the living thank you that we are clothed and in our right mind to seek you to spend time in your presence in your word that you would speak to our hearts and help us be aligned as you have called us to be aligned in this world God we just give you all glory all honor. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that is our teacher. We thank you for the many revelations and, and illuminating the word of God and giving us knowledge, insight, wisdom. But we also thank you for the grace that, accompan that accompanies that revelation. For as Paul said, with the much revelation, there was given a thorn to keep us from getting the big head puffed up in pride. And I thank you, God, that as we go forward, we would remain humble in your presence. Not a false humility, but truly saying, God, I recognize that you are in control, and we just thank you for all that you have in store for us, your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, and bless you, God. So as I was saying, um, the Authentic Word textbook is the Joyce Meyer um, Amplified Study Bible, because there are some devotionals that are deposited in there, and also in the back of the, the Bible, it has like a concordance. If you're dealing with this, then read this. And so, um, this particular, I don't even, well, I do know, but I don't want to say on here what I was looking at in the back, and it led me to 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 3, and the Spirit of the Living God said, that works in any re relationship. And so I just wanted to come and do this uh, love and respect. So here in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, I made my own parallel of Amplified Message Bible, but I also have the study Bible here with me. The Message Bible titles 1 Corinthians chapter 8, Freedom with Responsibility. So see, you have freedom, liberty, but there is responsibility attached to it. And I like the way the New King James um, titled this beginning section, Be Sensitive to conscience. So be sensitive to conscience. And so let's just begin reading. Um, you know what? I'm going to do something a little different than I normally do. I'm going to read it in the Message Bible first, then I'm going to come over and read it in the Amplified. And Joyce Meyer has a, a point, a life point for us to look at here. So the Message Bible, the first Corinthians chapter 8, it says, the question keeps coming up regarding meat that's been offered up to an idol. Should you attend meals which were meat, with, I'm sorry, with, where such meat is served or not. We sometimes tend to think we know all we need to know to answer these kinds of questions, but sometimes our humble hearts can help us more than our proud minds. I love the way the Message Bible says that. Sometimes our humble hearts can help us more than our pride minds, mm, our proud mind. We never really know enough until we recognize that God alone knows it all. Okay, that's the, that's the make sense version. Let's read it. I'm going to read verse 2 and 3 in the Amplified. It says, if anyone imagined, now let me read it all, verse 1. Now about food offered to idols. Of course we know that all of us possess knowledge concerning these things, yet more knowledge, yet mere knowledge causes people to be puffed up, to bear themselves lofty and be proud. See, that's a problem. And as, the, as I was quoting in the prayer, in, in uh, Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, or not in verse 9 is where it talked about grace, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul was saying, because God has given me uh, an insight, revelation, he's given me the capacity to see into the spirit realm, he's also given me a form in the flesh, a messenger from Satan to buffet me and to keep me from acting like I'm all puffed up and proud. And so now I see why Holy Spirit brought us back to this in, in chapter 8. So that we don't, don't let me just flip the pages. I, I, let me see one thing. It's First Corinthians chapter twelve. This is where we find out about um, uh, not First Corinthians. It's in Second Corinthians chapter twelve that it talks about the thorn in the flesh. I know it's chapter twelve. Um, Second Corinthians, this is not on my schedule. I'm getting off. I'm going to mess up my timing. But anyway, yeah, Second Corinthians chapter 12, it talks about the thorn in the flesh. 
so that because so that you don't get puffed up was it was given um, verse verse uh, 6 of 2nd Corinthians chapter 12 since I keep quoting it we need to go ahead and put it in context it says should I desire to boast I shall not be a witless braggart for I shall be speaking the truth but I abstain from it so that no one may form a higher estimate of me than is justified by what he sees in me or hears from me and to keep me from being so he said so that y'all don't he said, I'm going to be mindful to not talk lofty around you, to not talk over your head when I'm around you, because I don't, I want you to receive what I'm saying. And then verse seven, it goes on to say, and then that, that, that was, that was Paul's decision in, in verse seven, verse six, but verse seven, he says, and to keep me from being puffed up and too much elated by the exceeding greatness or the preeminence of these revelations, there was given me a thorn, a splinter in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to rack and buffet and harass me to keep me from being excessively exalted. God knows that if we're if we are left to ourselves and when we get all of this knowledge, he understands. Come on, the the original sin in the garden was because they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So if you try and operate in the knowledge that you're a good person and you know more than other people, there's a problem there. So Paul, Paul said that Jesus, God, had given him this messenger. He prayed three times that God would remove it. God was like, no, nah. his re response was, my grace is sufficient for you. I like how the Amplified says it's sufficient against any danger and enables you to bear the trouble manfully. God's strength is made perfect in our weakness. So then we go ahead and glory in the fact that we have these weaknesses. And so that was a sidebar. Let's come back over here to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. So he was saying at verse 1, this we had to go look at that so that this makes sense because whether we're, like I said, it, this is talking about marriage, engaged, um, whether it's with your pastor, um, with your boss or whatever. When you're dealing with someone that has a bunch of knowledge and they lord that knowledge over you or they act like I already know that you can't tell me nothing. The two have to, how can two walk together unless they agree? So we have to talk things out. We have to make sure that we're on the same page. Don't act like I know more than you or you know more than me because I'm going to tell you something about Paula and Denise. I always dumb down what I know. And that's why on June, June the 17th, the Spirit of the Lord had me to do bragging on the Lord because I do that. I kind of dumb down, as he said in, in verse 6 of 2 Corinthians 12, I kind of don't want to make it seem like I know more than you. So I'll come to your level so that I can bring you up to where you need to come. But don't mistake that as that I don't know nothing. And so I, don't, I try not to lord over people what I know. And this is a scripture for us to see. Definitely. What you do in the church, that's good. But do you know that your first responsibility is the God's divine order? That man, you're supposed to be submitted unto God. And that the woman is submitted unto you as you're submitted unto God. And I know that you speak to God and you are responsible. But he gave you a help me to help you with these responsibilities. And that's funny. When I say responsibilities, I think of how the Message Bible is titled Freedom with Responsibility. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, you you have you are the men you are the head you have the knowledge God speaks to you he gave the instructions to man therefore in the garden of eden therefore when woman sinned it was it was uh deception but when man sinned it was sin you know so there, let's get back into this right here verse 1 <laughs> He said, we all have uh, knowledge about wh what to eat and all that stuff. But mere knowledge causes people to be puffed up, to bear themselves loftily and be proud. But love, affection and goodwill and benevolence edifies. It builds up. It encourages one to grow to his full stature. So if we're operating in love and respect in our relationships... We should be uh, uh, encouraging, edifying, building people, building each other up and encouraging us to grow. A wise woman builds her house. She doesn't tear it down with her mouth. Uh, 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 that saying that says behind every successful man or, or to the side or at the side of every successful man is a successful woman because he's learned to listen to her help. She doesn't beat him over the head. She don't, you ain't listening to me. You just listen to what I say. That's not the way to operate, women. 
The way to operate, number one, is to spend time in the presence of God through prayer, worship, the word. And then when he reveals things to you, you ask God for wisdom as to how and when to reveal it to the husband. Or he'll ask you. God will open the door. You don't have to, I know all of this, and throw it all at him. Because most men can't handle it that way anyway. Good sidebar. Anyway, so <laughs> um, I looked up on Blue Letter some of the words there in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1, and that word about knowledge. It's knowledge. It's also translated science. And um, it says knowledge signifies in general intelligence and understanding. Um, the deeper, more perfect, and enlarged knowledge of this religion, such as belongs to the more advanced. So, you know, you're putting a religion over, but religion, relationship trumps religion all the time. And understand this, women... Um, are more relatable. So you want to listen, listen to what God is saying. Um, and that word knowledge is gnosis in the Greek. It's moral wisdom, such as seen in right living. And then um, the next word that I had looked up was the word puffed up. When it said don't get puffed up, that means to make natural, to cause a thing to pass into nature. So it may have been spiritual knowledge, but because you're puffed up with it. Now it's a natural knowledge that really doesn't have a spiritual. It means to inflate, to blow up, to cause, to swell up, to puff up, to make proud, um, to bear oneself loftily. And so we have to be mindful not to operate um, in this puffed up way. Don't let knowledge, don't let the information that you know, um, um, understanding, don't let intelligence cause you to be puffed up. Cause you to pass over into the natural side, leaning on your own understanding instead of God's understanding. And then the next word that I looked up was love. When it says, but love, you know, uh, charity, I mean, sorry, pride puffs up. Knowledge, uh, pride, not pride in the knowledge that you have. It puffs up, it swells, it causes problems. But love, the Amplify called it affection and goodwill and benevolence. Um, in the Greek word, that's the word charity. It means affection, goodwill, love, benevolence, brotherly love. And so we have to make sure that we're operating with this type of love. And it says it builds up. And the Greek word for the build up here is um, edify, builder. Come on, I didn't put the pronunciation of the word here. But anyway, it means to build a house, to erect a building. So a wise woman builds her house. So women, make sure that you're building up and not tearing down. And remember, he's responsible. So in, in volume one, single women, I gave an example. I didn't understand that I was talking to myself. Um, I was prophesying to myself back in 2002 for being married in 2016. And what I was saying in the chapter two, men, are you really ready? I said, what about submission? What about if you see your husband um, stuffing this bag full of stuff and you told him and you know that if he keeps stuffing this bag full of stuff, the bag is going to break. He keeps stuffing it, the bag breaks. As the wife, the helper, what is your response? Do you go get him another bag and pray that he learned his lesson, that he will listen either to God or what you were saying? Or do you hit him with, see, I told you, you don't ever listen to me. That's why the bag, hey, keep on breaking it. Second response is wrong. You have to, and, and I, 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 good Lord, that's how you build up the house. You, you plant seeds and get out the way. Let God build through him. Um, it means to build up from the foundation, to restore by building, to rebuild, to repair. It's a metaphor to promote growth in Christian wisdom, affection, grace, virtue, holiness, blessedness. It's to grow in wisdom or piety. And so those were some, I just wanted to go and look at <clears throat> where it's saying here that pride, that's the nasty stuff, the puffed up stuff, that stuff, that's not good. It doesn't do good. Knowledge, pride in knowledge apart from the fact of God. And so we want to be doing things in love. We say, walk in love. You're, you're, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. Say it seasoned with love. Okay. Verse 2 says, if anyone imagines that he has come to know and understand much of divine things without love, 
He doesn't yet perceive and recognize and understand as strongly and clearly, nor has he become as intimately acquainted with anything as he ought or as is necessary. And again, I keep hearing the 2 Corinthians 12 battle going on here. What, do you know that one of the aspects of God's love is his grace? He gives you grace to handle anything and everything that you go through. And so when you understand the grace of God, you understand divine things through grace, through love. So that you don't beat people over the head. They may be doing it wrong. But ask God for wisdom as to how to help them um, arrive at that right place. And then you don't have to get credit for it. They can, oh, I finally figured it out. Yeah, you finally figured it out. You sure did. Yes, yeah. Verse 3. <laughs> but if, if one loves God truly with affectionate reverence, prompt obedience, and grateful recognition of his blessing, he is known by God, recognized as worthy of his intimacy and love, and he is known, and he is owned by him. And so it's something when we, I like the, how the, the message says, we never really know enough until we recognize that God alone knows it all. And so in the Joyce Meyer, in the few moments left on this portion of this love and respect, at verse 1, she had a life point for us to see. Paul said that knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If we seek to walk in real love more than we seek to know things, we are much better off. Pride makes us think we don't need God. Pride always comes before destruction. Beware of pride and seek love. Love is humble, not puffed up or inflated with pride. Instead of being anxious to tell others what we know, let us strive to edify them and build them up. We don't need to try to impress other people. We need to humble ourselves and let God exalt us in his timing. And let me just give you the correlation of this 1 Corinthians 8 with 1 Corinthians 10. Um, they're just the backdrop of it. This message, I received this message a few years ago at Turning Point Faith Ministries. One of the, uh, I can't, <coughs> Copeland, <coughs> excuse me, I didn't bring my tea with me, <coughs> Bishop Copeland was sharing and he said the problem is that they haven't been baptized into the leadership. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, it talks about being baptized into leadership. When we get into a marriage, we it's a covenant, but it's also we become baptized into the leadership whereby the man, God leads the man and the man leads the woman and they lead the children. And so we got to be baptized into the leadership, number one, that God is the head of this household. It's very difficult when you get one partner that's not serving God. I said it's difficult. I did not say it was impossible because it is possible. All things are possible to God, with God. And so <clears throat> that's amazing because I just caught this right now as I'm uh, winding out the last few minutes that here in... Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. So we picked it up at chapter 8, talking about don't be puffed up with knowledge. But if you go back to chapter 7, I know that the Message Bible titles this to be married or unmarried. And so there's a message talking to believers about being married. And that's where you see that if one, um, Paul says, I would that you not get married because those that are married are concerned with the things of the world and how they may please their spouse. Because now you have to focus on a spouse. And so, yes, there's external ministry to happen, but you got to do the your Jerusalem now just grew and you have to live, as it says in 1 Peter chapter 3, husbands live with your wives according to knowledge, according to science. But look, don't let it get you puffed up. That's just, that's just, I didn't see this stuff. This is coming down low from heaven. God is showing us that in chapter 7, he said, and that's where we get the, I had the title for the Kingdom Business Singles Ministry that the Spirit of the Lord had me over for year, uh, seven years at uh, the Fellowship of Love Church. That the married people are concerned with the things of the world, but the, the unmarried people are concerned basically with kingdom business and how getting to know the Lord more. And so that's the point that we need to understand, that we need to really press in. You have to, you have to live according to science. But be sensitive to your conscience, your conscience. And, and if you keep going through, read through all of 1 Corinthians chapter 8. And um, we're going to close out this portion right here. And we'll pick up the next portion just skimming over 1 Corinthians chapter 9, going into 1 Corinthians chapter 10, looking at the fact that we are to be baptized unto their leadership. And when I first heard this, I didn't like it. 
back then. And But I was listening to a recording and the Spirit of the Living God told me, Paulette, I need you to go and do a love and respect. If we will understand 1 Corinthians chapter 7 through chapter 10 in context of what the Spirit of the Living God was saying, how much more happier we would be as we live holy unto the Lord. Holiness brings about happiness. All right, this is the second portion, and we're now at 1 Corinthians chapter 9. I'm looking at a pattern of self-denial. And if you take the time and go through and read here, Paul was basically giving a defense to religious people that were kind of telling him, who are you and why are you talking to us like that? And he was like, uh, at verse 1 of the Message Bible, he says, and don't tell me that I have no authority to write like this. I'm perfectly free to do this. Isn't that obvious? And he goes on and he's talking to his critics. He's responding to his critics at verse 3. He says, I'm not shy in standing up to my critics <laughs> who are on missionary assignments for God. Uh, who, we who are on missionary assignments for God have a right to dis decent accommodations. So the critic, they were talking about how he was living and how he was rolling. He was like, but I'm not even asking y'all to take care of me. I'm taking care of myself. And then he went at verse 8. He says, I'm not just sounding off because I'm irritated. <laughs> this is all written in the scriptural law. Moses wrote, don't muzzle an ox to keep it from eating the grain when it's threshing. Do you think Moses' primary concern was the care of farm animals? Don't you think his concern extends to us? Of course. Farmers plow and thresh expecting something when the crop comes. And so this was people, he money hungry and she just wants your money. Church people just want your money. And that's basically he was responding to them and telling them that's really not what's going on. But really what the point is, y'all trying to discredit me because you don't want the truth to get out. That kind of sounds like today. And so when we get down to verse 19. This section talks about serving all men. And I want to read that, trunk, tr that chunk of scripture in the Message Bible, verse 19 through 23. It is a watered-down version, but you will understand what the Spirit of the Lord was saying here. We're trying to get to chapter 10, but you had to see where he talked about Moses and the law. The critics is coming at him sideways. and he, <laughs> Verse 19, he says, Even though I'm free of the demands and expectations of everyone, I have voluntarily become a servant to any and all in order to reach a wide range of people. Religious, non-religious, meticulous moralists, loose living immoralists, the defeated, the demoralized, whoever. I didn't take on their way of life. So he's saying, I'm coming after them. I'm not, I'm not, I, I come to where they are so I can bring them to where they need to be. He said, I don't live their way of life. I kept my bearings in Christ, but I entered their world and tried to experience things from their point of view. I've become just about every sort of servant there is in my attempts to lead those I meet into a God-saved life. I did all this because of the message. I didn't just want to talk about it. I wanted to be in it. Mm. So then he, at verse 24, I'm just going to keep reading this on the Message Bible. Um, verse 24, he says, you've all been to the stadium and seen the athletes race. Everyone runs. One wins. Run to win. Mm, that's something. We're doing that on Cassandra Scott. <laughs> Focus to win. Run to win. All good athletes train hard. They do it for a gold medal that tarnishes and fades. You're after one that's God, that's gold eternally. And so this at verse 26, it shifts, well, verse 24, it talks about striving for a crown. So serve all men, and in the service of all men, I'm striving for a crown. This is amazing because Paul had to address the critics and the, and the tomfoolery here. And so verse 26 and 27, it says, I don't know about you, but I'm running hard for the finish line. I'm giving it everything I've got. No sloppy living for me. I'm staying alert and in top condition. I'm not going to get caught napping, telling everyone else all about it, and then missing out myself. And so that's um, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Joyce has a life point here for us to see. And she says, um, those of us who intend to run the race to win must conduct ourselves uh, temperately and restrict ourselves in all things. See 1 Corinthians chapter 9 verse 24 through 27. We can't expect someone else to make us do what is right. We must listen to the Holy Spirit and take action ourselves. And let me just say something because this is love and respect. Holy Spirit, he is referred to as the helper or the paraclete. In Genesis when God said it's not good the man be alone, I'll make him what? A helper. 
So we kind of have a connect with Holy Spirit. We do. That's why we need the two. We need male and female. He created man. He gave them dominion. And then we operate in different realms. But let me just keep reading. Paul said that he buffeted his body. He means that he disciplined it because he didn't want to preach to others, tell them what they should do, and then fail to do it himself. Paul was running the race to win. He knew he couldn't develop his potential without bringing his body, mind, and emotions under control. Uh, volume 3, Renewal of the Mind. Self-discipline is essential to the Christian life. Unless we discipline our minds, our mouths, and our emotions, we will live in ruin. Unless we learn to rule our tempers, all right, we can never achieve the successes that rightfully belong to us. And so myself, I can't talk about nobody else, my biggest it to be delivered from and to learn to get over and to be pleasing in the presence of the Lord was learning to get over anger and rage. And so I thank God for this right here because I went through a test on this week where I could have, because somebody else, well, we were having a conversation. Somebody else got a little heated. They took the conversation from a 10 up to 130, and I stayed at 10. That's growth in God because normally you take it to 130, I'm taking it to 150. But I didn't. I stayed at 10. And I'm not bragging on myself. I'm just using this as an example to share to us that God can change your temperament when you renew your mind to the word of God, when you understand. That's why all of these Bible studies are rooted and grounded in the word. And I'm telling you where to go in the word for yourself. So we're coming out of 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And it's talking about, you know, running a race. It's talking about being self-disciplined. It's talking about live, basically oneness. Live what you preach. I don't need you up here preaching one thing and living another way. That's a problem. That's, that's called bad representation in the body of Christ. And it has caused a bad taste in the mouth of so many believers. Because understand this with the prodigal son. That son that took his what belonged to him and went off into the world and did what he wanted to do. He was always the father's son. Even when he was out there partying and carousing and blowing away his money and doing everything he was big and bad enough to do. His daddy was still his daddy. Had he died out there, his daddy would have had to get him and come and bury him. But he came to himself while he was out there and he came back. And so I want us to know we have to self-discipline ourselves. We, we, we got to come to ourselves. You could have been, I have a, a couple that's attached to me. They've been together 20 years, I believe. And it was, it was a lot of just foolery going on in the beginning. Alcohol, alcoholism and partying and and and. Just things going on outside of the mirror. Not cool. Not nice. It was wrong. But then when their spiritual eyes began to open, and it was a process, they didn't shift at the same time. Just so happens the woman shifted first. The man is in the process of shifting. You have to operate from this place of self-discipline, of don't, no longer doing what you did before. And you can't tell me. This is, let me use myself. Stop using somebody else. Um, this, Like I said, this works in relationships, whether it's, husband and wife, minister, pastor, whatever. So when I went on last month to do the eulogy for my uncle, the Spirit of the Lord told me, he said, Paulette, I've been working with you for years to watch your mouth. Now they're talking about watch your mouth, your heart, your mouth, and out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. You got to watch it. He said, I've been dealing with you to stop cussing. He said, now when you go with your family, there is no way that you can be with them all weekend cussing and acting just like them, and then stand up on Monday night and expect them, and, and think they going to respect the thus says the Lord that comes out of your mouth. It was a test from the Spirit of the Lord, that because I would cuss, I got it under control. Two things that would make it come out, anger and rage, and then the other one was when I got around my family, because that was the norm. But God, he moved in, and I, I, I bridled my tongue because I, I had dealt with what was going on in my heart. So when we come to marital relationships, whether it was like that for years, I, this, this test was last month. Um, whether it, you've been operating like that, you know, all the, since I've been talking, and even as a child before I made sentences, I was cussing, and it wasn't right. I'm not, I'm not, I, I'm just being transparent and, and, and revealing a weakness that the Lord has stepped in and made strong. In the midst of it. So the enemy would like to keep me raggedy, bad representation, cussing with you and, and drinking with you and clowning with you. And then I expect you to hear when I say that God said something. 
Well, you can't tell me nothing about God because you're just as raggedy as me. But if I was there with you during that weekend and everybody's cussing and all of that other stuff and I'm practicing self-control, I'm not cussing with you. I'm with you because we're family and I love you. Like Paul said, I'm right there with you. I'm serving you. But I'm not acting like you, but I'm with you. So if we're out to lunch or dinner or something and you want a margarita and you have you a margarita, that's fine. I won't have one, but you can have one. I'm not going to judge you on if you want to have one. That's your decision. You see what I'm saying? But... I, then when it comes to talk about the significance of why alcohol is not right, you know, I tell it's a spirit. You use tequila. Look on the bottle. It says distilled spirits. It's a spirit. The only spirit I want in me is the Holy Spirit. So I choose, I can have one. He says be not drunk where it's excess. So I, I can, but I don't because I'm going to be with you, but I'm not going to be doing what you do. That was a sidebar. It was nowhere in there. But okay, so we come out of this life point. That's a really good point. I like when it's said that you can't expect somebody else to do what you're supposed to do. Those of us who intend to run the race to win must conduct ourselves temperately and restrict ourselves in all things. We can't expect someone else to make us do what is right. We must listen to the Holy Spirit and take action ourselves. And then let me throw this in there. Don't go back to the garden when stuff go wrong. Well, if you wouldn't have did this, and if you wouldn't have did that, and if they wouldn't have did this, and see, you always do Stop playing the blame game. You're right. I'm not even you're right. It's not about right and wrong this way. God, I missed it. I had it wrong. I repent. I'm changing my thinking. Help me change my thinking so I don't respond that same way when I'm put in that same situation again. Because guess what? You will be put in that same situation again. So now I went to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and I'm going to read it on the Amplified. Um, it says, For I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, that our forefathers were all under and protected by the cloud in which God's presence went before them, and every one of them passed safely through the Red Sea. And each one of them allowed himself also to be baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They were thus brought under obligation to the law, to Moses, and to the covenant consecrated and set apart to the service of God. Let's stop right there. It goes on to talk about eating and drinking. Let me keep reading. Verse 3 and 4. I want to get to the period. Verse 3 says, And all of them ate the same spiritual, supernaturally given food. That was the manna from heaven. Back then it was literal. Now we have it spiritual. Verse 4 says, And they drank the same spiritual, supernaturally given drink. For they drank from a spiritual rock, that's Jesus, which followed them, produced by the soul power of God himself, without natural instrumentality. And the rock was Christ. And so what this is saying is, in the past, God protected people through the cloud, through his presence that was before him. They had a cloud that went by day and a pillar of fire that went by night. And God's presence was in there and he was protecting them. We have to stay in the protection of God. This, this, this cloud, um, I just heard something when I said cloud. Glory to God. One moment. Let me just check on this. Hebrews 12, 1, therefore then, since we have, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses who have borne testimony to the truth, let us strip off and throw aside every encumbrance, unnecessary weight, and that sin which so readily, deftly, and cleverly clings to and entangles us, and let us run with patient endurance and steady and active persistence, the appointed course of the race that is set before us, looking away from all that will distract us to Jesus, the rock, mm -hmm, who is the leader and the source of our faith, giving the first incentive for our belief, and is also its finisher, bringing it to maturity and perfection. He, for the joy of obtaining the prize, he'll be talking about running for a prize, right? That was said before him, endured the cross, despising and ignoring the shame, and is now seated at the right hand of the throne of God. So the children, they, the cloud, there's a cloud of witnesses, others that have made it, learned from what worked for them and what didn't work for them. Don't keep repeating it. Don't, the, so my people say um, experience is the best teacher. No, it's not. I don't have to experience. I can learn from your experience and miss those hurdles. I don't need to buy a lesson. I can learn a lesson. Meaning, I don't have to pay the cost by going through ignorance. And he said that I don't want you ignorant. 
I don't want you ignorant. Understand that you have to get baptized in it. it verse 2. Each of them allowed himself also to be baptized into Moses in the cloud. So Moses was the leader and he was following the presence of God. So as wife, we have to allow ourselves to be baptized into Moses. Husband. Husband, you have to make sure that you're dealing with the cloud. Husband, in the earth realm, we have been given a wife, a help me, to help us tap into the cloud, the Shekinah glory of God. The cloud in the sea. And then we all, they didn't just give this supernatural food to just the men, the husbands. They, we all, the children and, and the spouse, the wives, ate this supernaturally given spiritual food and drank from this rock, the water of Christ. And, and if the, the woman is considered the bride of Christ, the, and, and, and Jesus, the husband, you are to take care of her like Christ took care of the church and washed her with the water of the word. We got to have the word of God is the final authority in our marriages. And we have to understand that this piece of submission, there's a book by A.W. Um, uh, P.B. Bunny, uh, P.B. Wilson, Bunny Wilson, and it's called Liberated Through Submission. When you read that book, you understand what the role of the man is and what the role of the woman is. And then you understand why the man needs help. You don't do it for him. You help him so that we operate the two as one and God is glorified. But as long as we're misunderstanding being baptized unto leadership, that the man needs to understand that your leadership is not, you can't let your feelings of fear or intimidation be what's leading you. The cloud, the presence of the Lord has to be what leads you. And it's something when the two come together, the two that are better than one, the, the two that when two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst. Can two walk together unless they agree? It's better when you get the two of you together. What are you hearing God say? What are you hearing God say? Let's hash this out. Ultimately, because you're the leader, you're responsible for the decision. But please make an educated decision. And women, that's why in chapter 8, it's saying, don't let knowledge puff you up and you think that you're the only. He's not the only one that knows. She's not the only one that knows. Women see pink. Men see blue. Together is purple. We're trying to get together for the purple of the thing, for the majesty of the thing, for the glory of the thing, for God's view and God's way. Both sides are needed. And so the two need to come together and really be one, understand that we're one baptized into Moses, into the cloud. So husband, really understand the presence of God, that you are baptized into that, and that the woman is baptized into your leadership, but sometimes you need to confer with her. Sometimes, wife, I just heard this while I'm doing this little whatever with my hand, that sometimes, wife, we act as Jethro. Jethro came to Moses right after this incident, and he was doing things, and he said, look, this thing that you're doing is not good. You're trying to, 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 Judge all of these people and, and, and be, uh, this is not good. You need to get some people that are full of the whole, that Holy Ghost wasn't there back then, but people of wisdom, your elders that understand me and they understand you and that you trust and let them deal with these issues. And when it's too much for them, then they'll bring it to you. So there was, there was a hierarchy in there. So in our marriages, God has designed a built-in hierarchy. And so I thank God that he wants to put the word to work in our lives, that we can truly live in the first Corinthians 7 to be married or unmarried you're married or you're engaged make your decision now that we live in the first Corinthians 8 that we're sensitive to consciousness that we are in first Corinthians chapter 9 that we're being servants to all men and we're running and we're patterning ourselves in a place of self-denial that you'll deny yourself of something so that others could come forward Women are, are in right now because of the shift. Women are so self-sacrificing, but men are to be the same way. And we are just waiting for God to turn the tides. God, we thank you and praise you for all that you have said and done on this Bible study. We thank you, God, for the love and respect reigning in relationships, that we would respect each other and operate in your love, the love of God. We give you glory and honor for blessing these marriage bonds and these that are engaged, for blessing us as we're submitted unto leadership in our church 
churches. God, thank you that you are helping us all be one, one in every area, the same me at work, at church, at home with my husband, with my children, that I am me. Who do men say I am? They need to say that I am a God-fearing person that prays to God, that can get an answer from heaven, that can manifest thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven through prayers, petitions, and giving the word of God access. We give you glory. We give you honor. We give you praise. Thank you, God, for being God in our relationships, in our marriages, and we'll continually glorify you, honor you, and praise you in 